your nose glows when you live in Canada. Yeah. 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 I can tell them why not, but I don't. I don't run into smokers quite like I used to. No. Yeah. You, you, you've been known to have a cigarette or two. What? You've been known to have a cigarette or two, right? No. <laughs> no, 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 no. I no. never smoke. <laughs> never. Never. I smoked for many years. Yeah. When, I yeah? quit, okay. when I quit, I quit. <laughs> yeah. I tried just one when it was nature and it was horrible. And I yeah. never yeah. did it again. Good, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I, I would say that uh, this is a, this is a good turnout for the last session on a on a Saturday afternoon. I think there is some anticipation of the quality of the panel, and I I share uh, that anticipation with all of you. Uh, it struck me as uh, uh, Judge Wald was talking about uh, an international definition of rape that perhaps some of our politicians in this country could benefit from a tutorial by her uh, about what rape is. Um, <laughs> Uh, the, uh, uh, the, the panelists uh, have been given a, 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 a very restrictive charge uh, to uh, uh, reflect a bit on perhaps some of the sessions that uh, have gone before if they wish, to uh, look forward if they wish, and uh, uh, this is a panel with a, a, a rich uh, level of experience. Uh, they're, they're also going to perhaps tell a story or two that they think is indicative of some of the ingenuity that can, uh, can take place in, uh, in human rights advocacy. So um, we're going to, uh, we, we, have, uh, we have Paris, we have uh, uh, Buenos Aires, we have New York, and we're going to, to end with the, the Stanford of the East. Um, uh, Judge, Judge Wald also implicitly made a case for uh, uh, at least a correlation between uh, uh, gray hair and wisdom. And so we're going to start this panel with the grayest of us all. So, yeah. David, yeah. without further ado. Should I say thank you for that? <laughs> Lovely introduction. Okay. It's really a very interesting shade of blonde, Eric. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and thank you, and it's great to be here, and I want to thank the organizers. And it's a great personal honor to follow Pat Wald, who is a, it's too bad she's not here. I was going to say some nice things about her. Uh, I had the honor of uh, picking Pat up from the airport in 1999 when she first arrived at the tribunal, and it was about 6 o'clock in the morning, a very cold, grainy day, uh, gray, uh, gray day in the, in the Hague. And the last thing I wanted to do, but I was chef de cabinet to the president. That was part of my job. And by the end of the the the, uh, the car ride from the airport, I said, "Wow, we have a judge here finally." And uh, she really proved it. And you saw some of that uh, in her talk. Um, and well, she, I just wanted to add a footnote to to uh, what she said because while there weren't many female or women judges. We did have uh, Louise Orbor as prosecutor. We had Dorothy Sampaio as the registrar. So all of the principals in the court were women. And I think that really made a difference and uh, I think helped shape the, lead the court in the right directions. And of course, when Louise, Louise Arbor uh, followed, uh, was followed by Carl Del Ponte, who I was deputy to. So there was a great deal of leadership and, and ICTY and uh, also in other parts of international criminal justice. But what I thought I uh, would do, I'd probably have to go from a transitional justice angle uh, to talk about the question that, that we've been given today. And I, I will start with a little bit of a, a story that I, I think may be illustrative of some of the challenges that we face in this, in this work. Um, I was in northern Uganda uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, just after the ICC conference in, uh, in Kampala. And I was with a, a, uh, a group of uh, young women who enacted a, a play about uh, what had happened to them. They, uh, uh, this is northern Uganda. I think if uh, you didn't know who Joseph Kony was uh, after the, vi the video went viral from Capture the Night, everybody knows who jo Joseph Kony was. But they were actually, uh, uh, with, their, with their play, they pretty rudimentary, but showed themselves actually as they taken from their families. Um, the government did not provide security. They acted out what the government did. The government told them to be drunk, not paying attention, not giving security. 
to the to the uh, to the populace. They were taken from their families. They were then uh, basically um, treated. Uh, they were they were raped. They actually ended up burying, in many cases, the the, uh, the children of their of their abusers. And then they were forced to commit crimes themselves. Um, and eventually, uh, as the situation settled down, they began to live with the legacy of that, uh, of that past. And after they enacted this play, which I thought um, brought out some of the issues that we face, the complicated issues on uh, transitional justice and, and gender, um, talking to them, uh, some of the issues that they raised uh, shows some of the unintended uh, consequences. They were very concerned about being prosecuted by the ACC they had actually been involved in atrocities themselves and been forced to. And, sorry, speak more loudly, okay. All right, is, is this better? Turn it on. It should be, is it on? No, it's not on, no wonder. Is that, okay. So I was just at the, okay. Um, and they uh, and a great deal of uh, bitterness at the government for failing to protect them. And of course, one of the things that we look at at transitional justice is the reestablishment of civic trust, the breakdown of civic trust. The government failed to provide them with basic protection. And then several of them told uh, stories of seeing their uh, the fathers of their children forced fathers of their children, in the sense they forced children um, around town, not being acknowledged by them, and not being punished, not mm -hmm. being held accountable. And I think it just it goes to illustrate some of the points I wanted to raise and talk about today, um, because I think these are complex situations, and they, gr they pose great challenges. And if we, just to spend a moment or two to talk about transitional justice as a, as a field. And I will talk about some of the, the you know, I think, the deep challenges we face, particularly as we move from transitional justice mechanisms or measures in post-authoritarian situations to post-conflict situations. Uh, we, uh, the, 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 the four measures that we talk about in transitional justice are obviously truth and uh, either through truth and reconciliation commissions and truth-telling processes, criminal justice. Uh, you've heard on the international level of the ICTY and the ICTR and the ICC, although um, th that is changing and we will be left fairly soon, I think, with the International Criminal Court and domestic prosecutions and, and, uh, and investigations, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, Reparations programs, which uh, where the state bears the responsibility of, of either recognizing in monetary or at least symbolic form the injuries that the uh, that the individuals, the victims, have suffered, uh, because that recognition of that suffering is very is critical to to uh, to, to victims as they re reintegrate into society, and then what's sometimes called guarantees of non-repetition um, or uh, institutional reforms. There is nothing that undermines civic trust or the reintegration process more than the rape victim going to the police station and seeing her abuser behind the police counter. Uh, so the reform of military and the reform of police and security sectors are really uh, quite, quite important. And it's these four mechanisms working together, or these four measures working in an integrated approach rather than we see sometimes that they're tried in a one-off manner and frequently we see failure there. So it's an, an integrated approach and I would, I would, I would say uh, at the outset that it, I mean, it's quite clear that women are subject to specific types of sexual violence. It's very clear in the former Yugoslavia, Judge Wald talked about that, but uh, rape, sexual violence was used as a method of war, was used as a method of warfare repeatedly, and you just got a flavor of that in her talk. 
if you go back and look at some of the cases of the ICTY and others, there were rape camps uh, and they were used particularly against the Muslim population uh, and to, to really be a method of humiliation and to, uh, to uh, particularly given the traditional and religious values of that community. So there were particularly vile crimes and the ICTY and the, and the ICTR, um, I won't go into the detail because I think Judge Walt covered that, but they have established some very important precedents as, uh, for crimes against human, rape as a crime against humanity, rape as a war crime, rape as torture, and rape as an element of uh, genocide. Um, but women are also uh, v very vulnerable in conflict situations to, uh, because of the, their status in society. And uh, you see this uh, over and over, uh, not only uh, for violence, but uh, being subject to violence, but frequently inheritance laws and, and, the, and property laws where, where they lose their husband and they lose their title to property, they lose their status in society and the, the, the consequences can really be uh, devastating. Uh, there's, a, there's a quote by uh, the Special Rapporteur for Women, who, that, uh, I think I remember it um, almost word for word, and that is that uh, women today going out and, and chopping wood are in a more dangerous situation in conflict societies than soldiers on the front line. And I think that's a very powerful way to put it, but women are in a, extremely vulnerable position uh, with respect to, to, to conflict today. And we see this in the DRC, where you have innumerable uh, numbers of rapes and gender-based uh, violence uh, and crimes and abuses. Um, I've, uh, I've, I've talked a little bit about uh, the uh, criminal justice side. I, what I, I would say that I think that we in the transitional justice field, uh, uh, I think that uh, it would be fair to say that in the past, gender and the gender dimension was not taken into account in the way it should have been. Uh, I think we have some evidence over in, in recent years that this has been recognized and we see changes in the approaches uh, in a number of transitional societies. Uh, I've, we've, we've already talked about changes with respect to uh, the way rape is looked at, the way the, uh, and the criminal justice process. Uh, in reparations programs, we've seen some very important and interesting steps. Uh, uh, I talked about Morocco in a meeting earlier yesterday, uh, and one can make some criticisms on it wasn't a particularly, uh, it's hard to call it a transitional country, but we had, we had the change from one king to the next. And there was a, 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 a commission uh, set up which did award reparations. And it, it adopted, uh, I think, some really uh, a, a very innovative approach in that uh, instead of following um, traditional inheritance laws to, to award reparations, it uh, instead put those inheritance laws to one side, which would have disinherited women, because the oldest son would have inherited, uh, would have would have normally uh, received the the benefit, and it said that w for this purpose, women were the heads of household, and therefore received the reparations directly. Uh, so this is a, uh, and it also made an important uh, further step, and it said that. Uh, the, <coughs> Mission provided that sons and daughters would inherit equally, and that would that was contrary to to traditional practice and law. And also, it it, it also had an, an uh, another important innovation, uh, and that it, it it held that where women were held in detention, and if you know the situation in Morocco, there were many thousands of people who were held in detention. Um, they actually received a higher reparation payment than men received uh, because actually their suffering would be greater and the, the consequence of losing their childbearing years, particularly since they'd be supported by their children uh, after, after, after their husband would, would pass the scene. So they received a larger reparation than men did. 
So very innovative uh, steps, even though in a, a situation that we can criticize, uh, uh, given that uh, we had, didn't really see a democratic transition in the country. Uh, there's some other important uh, uh, cases that are out there. I would mention the, uh, in the Inter-American Court, there's the Cotton mm -hmm. Field versus Mexico decision. I won't go into the details because of time, but it, uh, it, uh, it awarded reparations where three, uh, three girls were killed by non-state actors and the state was held accountable, Mexico was held accountable for failing to properly investigate and prosecute and punish and for creating really a culture that discriminated against women mm -hmm. and uh, r reparations were awarded uh, in that situation. So, uh, I think there are a number of, uh, a number of uh, steps that are, are um, innovations that we're seeing to begin to address uh, some of the, uh, to ensure that the gender dimension is being taken into account. On truth commissions, uh, I, I would also say that we've, we've seen that there's a good bit more in terms of uh, dialogue with women's groups and the, and the formation of truth commissions. Uh, before either the legislation or the the uh, the, the relevant uh, acts are put in place, uh, there are specific dialogues with uh, women victims. Uh, the South African Truth Commission had a number of, uh, of uh, specific uh, meetings and and uh, exchanges. We saw this in Peru. We see that in, in seen in East Timor as well. So I think. Uh, I know that uh, we have limited time, so I wanted to just make a, a couple of comments that go to the question that was actually posed to us. And I, um, it seems like uh, that, that uh, uh, there are a number of challenges uh, that uh, I, would, I, would, I would talk about. Um, one, one of the things that I think is that, we're, that we have to look at in the field of transitional justice Generally, and I think it has a, uh, a significant impact on, from, from a gender perspective, is that we're seeing transitions move from places like Latin America, where we're talking about transitions in, from a post authoritarian situation uh, to transitional justice mechanisms being applied in, in post conflict situations. And in post-conflict situations, we frequently see truth commissions, other uh, reparations programs coming out of peace negotiations. And peace negotiations tend to be uh, done frequently with international mediation, but with warring parties. And warring parties generally are men. And women are very underrepresented in those discussions and those negotiations, and they're not part of those negotiations. So as we move into these uh, situations, we see more and more transitions around post-conflict and transitional justice measures incorporated in peace agreements. And we can think of a number. Kenya is, is, a, is an example. Um, Nepal, we can, ar around the world, we're seeing more and more utilization of transitional justice measures in peace agreements, in negotiations. And there are a lot of debates around that. One is the peace and justice discussion, uh, what happens about uh, criminal justice and accountability. But I think from a, from a, if we look at it from a question of whether women are included in the process, we need to think very hard and seriously about how we can ensure that women, both as a marginalized group but as the largest members of these societies, are included in the process because, as I've made the points earlier, they are in many ways the uh, most impact, impacted by conflict and violence. And if they don't have a seat at the table, uh, then there these these issues and, and, and gender dimension is frequently going to be either marginalized or, or put to uh, to one side. I think also that uh, there's an, another challenge that we have to, to think about, and it, uh, it comes even in the post-authoritarian situation. We're looking at, uh, and you've heard about from Hassam and others, uh, and there's a lot of discussion around uh, the transitions in the Middle East and North Africa, 
and then in other traditional societies as well. So even in th those situations, and we've, we've th this, this discussion, is, or this conversation has been running through uh, all of the last two days, the, the, in a traditional society, women uh, tend not to be represented in the discussions. They tend not to be involved in the, uh, um, in the debate, and, they, and the religious dimension or the traditional dimension tends to diminish the role of women in either the negotiation of, uh, of uh, the, the transition, their voices not being included in the transition, some of the issues that all the panelists have, 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 have mentioned. But that has a big impact or potentially has a big impact on the design of transitional justice me measures and mechanisms to be applied in that society. And of course, I would argue very strongly that uh, it's essential to have uh, justice to deal with the past. If you don't address the past, then you're going to really be condemned in some way to probably repeat it down the road. And if we, if, if we, if we find that uh, women are not included if the issues that um, we've been talking about over the last two days are not put on the table as a part of truth commissions, as a part of, of criminal justice processes, as a part of reparations, then uh, transitional justice is not going to be well served and the society is not going to be well served. And I would just close with one other point um, that um, particularly since uh, we had we've had a discussion, and, and Pat has certainly uh, very well put the precedents on, on uh, rape as a crime against humanity, as a war crime. Um, the international courts have been really played an extremely significant role in, doing, in, in establishing these precedents. It's really critically important precedents. But I think as all of those who have been involved in and, and this part of the wor work, and I spent much of my career in it, we are now going to a, a, a place where we have the International Criminal Court and we have national prosecutions under the principle of complementarity. Um, I don't have to tell you that the ICC is floundering. I mean, I think that's clear to all. And I think there's, there's, there's a good bit, uh, there's a big challenge that uh, we're going to have a limited number of cases at the ICC, many of them perhaps not establishing the precedence or certainly not acting with the speed and with the clarity that we, hard to believe I'm saying, not acting with the speed at the ICTY. I really thought that was pretty slow some days, but, uh, uh, but not with acting either with the speed or the clarity or with the docket. We are going to be re relying on national prosecutions and investigations, and if we're going to, if we, if, if the the the, uh, the battle against impunity is at the national level, then we really have to find ways to ensure that they're done effectively, but also that the battles that have been have won uh, regarding um, regarding rape as a war crime and uh, the crimes of sexual uh, uh, abuse uh, actually move forward. We have to do a much better job in ensuring that this is done at the national level as well. So another big challenge. Uh, there are more, but I think I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let's go, please. Thank you, Eric. Uh, <clears throat> it's a privilege to be here in Stanford, and this has been two terrific days discussing this issue. And I definitely bring a lot of ideas to back to Buenos Aires. Um, to talk about the, the question that were pointed out in this panel, I, I, f I will follow the David and, and uh, the Judge Wall uh, topic, but uh, from a more national perspective uh, in which uh, cells uh, uh, works. Uh, Part of its work, and and I think that reflects uh, opportunities on and challenges of the combination between the uh, the strategies of human rights movement and gender equality movement. Um, I think uh, I will talk um, from an 
Argentinian perspective, but also I think that uh, also can be applied for the rest of Latin America. You know, the, the, the so-called transitional justice uh, a case of Argentina uh, started, I mean, it's, it's a case that has everything. I mean, it started in, uh, after the dictatorship in 1993. Uh, it has, um, uh, truth Commission at the very beginning, a uh, uh, military junta trial that was the, the second uh, trial of this type uh, uh, undertaken by national courts, the, 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 the first one, the, the, Greece, the, 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 Greek, the Greek coronal trials. Uh, in this uh, trial was in 1985. Uh, uh, there were uh, conviction for the main members of um, former president for the military junta. And then uh, during the 80s also, the Congress passed amnesties, two different amnesties laws, and then uh, the, there were presidential pardons. So there was a, like a political impunity that ended uh, with uh, total impunity for the uh, crimes against humanity committed by the dictatorship. I mean, just the facts for you, those that don't have idea about, I mean, information about that, the the Argentina dictatorship was more one of the most brutal in the in the region. Uh, the, there are more, than, I mean, at least fifteen thousand disappearances, uh, thousands of extrajudicial executions, uh, massive uh, torture and systematic tortures, uh, and uh, illegal detentions, and so on. So. Uh, in the 90s, I mean, part of the, the, the work of cells was uh, also to overcome this impunity obstacle that uh, uh, avoid these uh, prosecutions. And with the development of international criminal law, uh, the, 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 the process of the, the ICC, the detention of Pinochet in London, and the creation of the ICTY and ICTR, uh, the, the human rights organization that were the the, the force behind this process uh, finally made a, a case at the, at the Argentinian justice uh, that was won at the Supreme Court. And we got a decision from the Supreme Court that nullify the amnesty laws and reopen the, uh, the process of justice uh, for these gross human rights violations. And, and today there are there has been, I mean, this was in 2005, and today there has been more than uh, 60 uh, de uh, judicial decisions, sentences, uh, 250 convictions uh, for member of military, uh, uh, military arm, army, navy, and also uh, security forces members. Um, of course, uh, several acquittals and and so on. So this is. Uh, and, and this is interesting because uh, this is a, a process uh, that has been undertaken from the beginning with a national uh, court. I mean, it's a national mechanism. Uh, we have used in the middle when we had an impunity policy international mechanism, but uh, today and at the beginning was a national court that undertaken this, these trials. Uh, uh, the same is happened I mean, in Chile, Peru, and Uruguay. This is something distinctive from the region. But uh, the, the interesting thing that I want to highlight is uh, uh, just in 2007, uh, uh, my organization, CELS, uh, was created in, in 1979, and so it's like 30, 34 years old. And the main mandate was to undertake uh, these cases during the transition, and now we have a broader mandate. Uh, and we were, I mean, one of the, I mean, we were the, the organization that have litigated the case that won at the Supreme Court, the nullification of the laws and the, the amnesty laws. But uh, just in 2007, like four, five years ago, after like 30 years of this process, uh, we started to uh, talk with a group of victims, uh, women victims that have never talked before um, that had testified several times in different cases that they were victims of uh, torture, of uh, many practices, but they never talked before that they were victims of rapes. Uh, so with our mental health team and our uh, lawyer team, 
we met with them for two years, uh, once a week uh, for two years uh, in order to, to hear them. And, and, and they finally realized that uh, the sexual violence that they were uh, uh, that, that they were victim of was also uh, a, a human rights violations and they were part of of the torture that they had um, suffered so in in that year in 2007 I mean in Argentina uh, system we have the figure of private prosecutor in addition of the public prosecutor we are part of the process. So in in that time we uh, we submit uh, a case in the uh, in the naval mechanic of school that is one of was one of I mean the, the, the biggest clandestine center during the dictatorship in which more than five thousand victims passed. Um, we put, I mean, a complaint. I mean, we brought this case of these victims, and particularly one of them. I mean, her name was Graciela Garcia, yeah. uh, and we want to uh, the. I mean, we asked the prosecutor to investigate this case. I mean, never before in these 30 years, uh, sexual violence had been investigated in the. Uh, uh, the case, I mean, the case the in in. I mean, several investigations that are still uh, undergoing. Uh, and now, I mean, at that moment, we realized the, the main obstacle for the judicial operators uh, in order to deal with these cases, I mean, to deal with the, with the victims, in order to take testimonies, the, the, I mean, the society in order to hear uh, these, uh, these stories and the lawyers and I mean the I mean the the the, the system was not prepared uh, in order to treat I mean to deal with uh, cases of sexual violence. Um, today uh, the the case is uh, is gonna be I mean we so so we decided to to uh, to have a specific uh, strategy in order to. Uh, I don't like the, the word that to educate the judiciary, and, but to actually educate ourselves in order to to deal with uh, these cases. We did a, a research and we organized uh, a international seminar with uh, Women Link International about uh, uh, sexual violence as a, as a crimes against humanity. We invite. Uh, um, Prosecutors, um, we invite the Moreno Campo at that time, the 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 prosecutor for the ICC, and and others uh, judges uh, from Argentina. And actually, we have a, like a parallel agenda of advocacy to the courts in order to sensibilize the courts to treat uh, uh, how to deal with these cases, and and also. We did it, I mean, in different uh, provinces of Argentina, and we participated in a UN Women Seminar on this case, and also we also uh, uh, discuss and, 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 and exchange experiences with other organizations of uh, women organizations. And this particular case is gonna be, the trial is gonna start uh, in, in two weeks, uh, there are, uh, uh, at least two uh, perpetrators that has been indicted in the in a more uh, this is going to be like a mega trial in which uh, is going to be discussed the the responsibility for more than 70 perpetrators and more than 700 uh, victims uh, but since then since 2007 already had been one conviction uh, for rape as an autonomous crimes against humanity as a autonomous crime of torture um, and there are many others investigations uh, in the way in addition of this particular one. Uh, so I think uh, this is, uh, I mean, it can be seen as a positive story uh, of the combination and so on, uh, strategies of the human rights movement and the women movement, but at the same time, I think it reflects how uh, Far we are uh, in in uh, to the uh, point in which we really 
uh, work together and in which uh, gender equality is uh, uh, an important uh, point, uh, an important topic of the agenda of the human rights movement, uh, particularly in Latin America. I think the, uh, the agenda of the traditional human rights organization in Latin America was influenced by violations committed by the dictatorship or in the middle of uh, conflict army, uh, armed conflicts. In this context, the specific vulnerabilities that affect women often uh, had uh, been invisibilized uh, uh, <coughs> in the traditional human rights agenda. Uh, Sometimes, uh, or I would say many times, there is a male-centered vision in the human rights field. Um, and this is not only uh, from in Latin America. I think that the, that was demonstrated by the uh, kind of absurdity of the Vienna Conference uh, in which its accomplishment was that to recognize that women and girls' rights uh, were also human rights uh, uh, rights. So uh, this is not exclusively from the region. that. I, it's, uh, uh, I should say, uh, is quite patri patriarchal uh, as well. Um, and so there are some challenges in order to, to overcome uh, these, uh, uh, these problems. I mean, on the one hand, I'm talking from my own experience at CELS in my organization, there are like some time internal, I mean, there are fear or resistance to address uh, an issue that will underscore the concern that affect uh, uh, women, but that will overcome the like m the more uh, uh, broad uh, traditional human rights uh, agenda. But uh, but that I mean, in the at the end of this, there is I think a lack of understanding uh, on the need to incorporate the gender equality as a substantive issue to make and to have a more uh, robust democracy. I mean, uh, I think still in Latin America or uh, the human rights movement see the human, the, the, the gender agenda as something separate from the human rights agenda. Uh, and this is an, uh, it's a cultural, uh, I, I think it's more, of course, uh, 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 differently than the Middle East uh, in, in Latin America is more cultural than the religious uh, aspect of, of this. So, uh, just to finish, for for uh, in in the case of cells, we have uh, take some actions in order to to move forward uh, with uh, incorporating gender's perspective in our uh, agenda. And one of them uh, is not to have like a, a gender program. I mean, not to have a, like a separate program to to deal with women issues, but also to uh, to. To, to try to cut across in uh, all our uh, uh, agenda and all our topics the gender perspective. Uh, making visible certain issues in our annual report, we also, I mean, from uh, many years uh, until, I mean, in the past, we have incorporated uh, uh, some milestone key issues on, Roman, I mean, on women rights sites, such abortion, sexual and reproductive rights, family planning, women health, and so on. Um, and also we have uh, uh, incorporated the, I mean, this, this issue in other, uh, in other issues in addition of the, of the, of the prosecution for uh, crimes against humanity, also in the reparation agenda, uh, rights of persons deprived of liberty, I mean, the prisons, we, we work with a gender perspective as well, and also in our work on economic and social rights. And, and for, for us, it has been very important to work on alliance uh, on this issue, uh, we have submitted amicus curiae in cases like the case of Jessica Gonzalez, that is a U.S. case that probably you know that is being at the Inter-American system. We have uh, uh, presented another amicus brief in uh, Latin American and Caribbean Committee for Women Rights on a case at the Inter-American system it's called Karen Atala versus Chile. Uh, Miss Atala is a, a woman that uh, lost the custody of her children because she is lesbian. Um, and we also have been working in alliance in Argentina. Uh, that is the, the most uh, current issue today the, on abortion for therapeutic reason or for rape. Uh, actually, last week, uh, the, there was, I mean, there is a, we have a, the, the therapy, I mean, the abortion for rape as, is legal, but uh, in this case, the court has been 
an obstacle, not a, 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 a tool to, uh, to allow, I mean, the, the course uh, has been used by the pro-family organization in order to avoid abortions. And so now we are working with a group of uh, women in, in this issue, and we have been working for many years and with uh, women groups uh, in order to submit uh, the shadow report at CEDO, and that has been very helpful for us in order to incorporate the gender issue in our agenda. So today, I think, still we are in the middle uh, of the of the road, and and I think I, I think another challenge that I, I will mention is sometimes there is like a reciprocal uh, untrust, but but uh, with I mean from the the the, the women movement as well. I mean, uh, they 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 claim all the time that we we have to incorporate the women issue in our agenda, and when, when we do it, I mean, they feel in kind of, I mean, like we are competing with them. And so this is a kind of attention that we have to, to, to manage. Uh, I will stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I, a dear friend who uh, recently died, I, uh, an Argentinian political philosopher, uh, Guillermo O'Donnell, I, I held out the, the internal secret police of Argentina in the mid-1970s uh, as exhibit A of the expression, to my uh, friends, everything, to my enemies, the law. <laughs> and, and your case uh, illustrates that well. Antoine. Yes, good afternoon. Merci, Eric. Good afternoon. My name is Antoine. I come from France, the country of human rights, of the Lumière, of uh, secularism and laicite. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and the country where women were first entitled to vote in 1944, and which it's been only four months since, for the first time in its history, France has a 100% gender-balanced government. So this was just as a matter of presentation. And I'm also here, <laughs> I'm also here as, uh, as, uh, uh, for my organization, International Federation for Human Rights, FIDH, well, my dear boss is Suhair Balassan from Tunisia, Shirin Ebadi from Iran, Asma Jahangir from Pakistan, Alex Bielatsky from Belarus, who unfortunately was not awarded the Nobel Peace Prize two days ago, or Nabil Rajab, who Except also is jailed like <laughs> Alas. Now, this being said, challenges and opportunities for cross collaboration in our field between human rights movement, women's rights movement, it's late and a lot have been said with a lot of talent. I just limit myself to three remarks, three. The first relates to tango and to clusters, Arab, Arab appraisals. Um, obviously, in this field, as we've been taught and learned, there is a before and an after. Before revolutions, it was so tough for human rights NGOs to understand how much gender equality and women's rights are at the heart of building, moving this, the whole society. Um, I, I, th I would hope, and hearing from Osam earlier, that it's been a little changing, but that's not the point I want to make now. I want to refer to our techniques collaborating, exchanging, and to refer to our modality for actions. And especially the question that was uh, illustrated about engaging, engaging, bridging. Now, a few months ago, uh, in a collaborative approach uh, of a platform uh, gathering women's rights NGOs, human rights NGOs from the region, we've been working on comparative law and practices, kind of taking a, a kind of analytical picture of what was the situation in the, in the region, in North Africa, Middle East, in, in, in all the countries that were going through revolutions or appraisals and, and repression. Uh, and, and part of the questioning in trying to, 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 to strategize was, OK, should, should we go you know, the French way of secularity and laicite and confront? Or should we go engage? Or actually, is the question either, or is the question end, and how to articulate? 
and we were discussing yesterday Tunisia. And, and, and in Tunisia, it's like in many other countries, but in Tunisia in particular, it's so easy, you know, the way, the, the way it's put on the table of a very strong opposition between the two tenets of the, of the discussion. Mm -hmm. The hardliners, Salafists on the one hand, and secularists on the other. Well, I mean, I, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I, I see this from, and I expect some, some reading from some newspapers, not from NGOs, not from the human rights and, and women's rights movement, trying to grasp the nuances and difficulties of situations. I'm getting to the tango point. <laughs> in Tunisia, in Tunisia, as we all know, the 1956 and 57 code, family code, and uh, and laws um, have been enshrined and defended uh, by the ones qualified as secularists today. But in fact, was much more wide than that, and fighting for rights of women against violence against women, the same ones that today are criticized for being, you know, the tough fundamentalist secularists because they are witnessing and trying to find the proper technique to oppose or reduce the scope of a very violent and daily attack against women's rights uh, in, in, their, in their country. And precisely, that's my point, it takes two to tango. Engaging means finding the space and techniques to tango. To, to, to try to manage peacefully dissensus, disagreement. When we've been witnessing, uh, at least since 23rd October last in Tunisia, the, the, the last election, um, nearly weekly, weekly events that came to question the willingness of, the, of, a, of a government with, with full legitimacy, and that's another part of the dilemma, full legitimacy, free and fair elections, its willingness to actually implement its commitment and, and protect women's rights and protect the family code and protect equality in law, if not in practice. Um, these attacks, very violent, uh, re result in calls to murder calls for uh, the president of FIDH to be, to be sued for treason and convicted to death. Uh, calls in the, in, the, in the mosques on Friday against them. Um, and more than that, I think it has to be seen as part uh, of um, um, many fields related to the judiciary, to freedom of expression, related to many, many fields of the society. It's not just one issue, and there are other issues. The issue of women's rights is at the very heart of the, uh, of the political debate and the designing of what Tunisian would like to see like a new society. So engaging the platform for dialogue is the National Constituent Assembly. The dialogue is taking place there. But in fact, on the political scene, actors do act and make and try to make themselves heard outside this scene too, of course. And when, uh, again, uh, three days ago, uh, a woman was raped by two policemen, um, policemen, and she is being sued for uh, uh, attempt to public morale. Uh, when uh, uh, the ruling party, uh, the major, the, the principal ruling party, uh, is uh, trying to get control of the public media through firing and putting uh, its own staff in place to prepare for the next election. It's a, well, all this is to be taken into account. And again, I think there is a need here for strategic brainstorming. That's a way of strategic collaboration about the method and, and especially about uh, uh, inclusive method rather than exclusive method. Um, especially when, uh, and I move to Bahrain, um, the fantastic opportunity and challenge of having uh, the very issue of women's rights and SIDO 
at the very heart of the political discussion. But in Bahrain, it's different, uh, as, as we know. But we see CEDO used by the government to try to disqualify its democratic opposition uh, in the name uh, of, uh, of um, uh, well, fearing, fearing that the, the, that the opposition, which basically could be said 70% to be Shia, would like to uh, overthrow this minority government, Sunni, uh, and put in place a pro-Iranian, uh, pro-Mola regime. Nabil Rajab, I don't care he's Shia or not, and I won't tell you, although I know. I know he's secular. And he was just convicted to three years jail because basically he's got 170,000 followers on his Twitter account out of one million inhabitants in Bahrain. And when he calls for peaceful demonstration, this is the real threat. Now the government said, OK, he is Shia. They are Shia. We're going to oppose them, Sido. And here there's something also interesting that we should reflect upon. Last week or two weeks ago in Geneva, the Bahrain government was responding to UPR recommendation and was very pro proud to say, I'll put on the table 160 recommendations, yes, out of 174 that was made by my peer. Among them, eight recommendations related to CEDO implementation. And the intention of the government, we know because we engaged with the first circles around the king, the intention of the government in doing that was to also, and mainly, I think, to disqualify its own domestic opposition because of being Shia and, in fact, supporting inequality and men's superiority. So one of the strategic and defensive reactions of Bahrain Center for Human Rights and, uh, and other independent NGOs uh, uh, in, in Bahrain uh, were to say, hey, look at our alternative report to CEDO, which we produced two, two years ago. OK, very good. But you have some more work to do for full implementation and incorporation of CEDO into domestic law and practice. I'm just referring to this as another example where further strategic collaboration is needed to try to find update ways and method not to let alone such governments in trying in reality to undermine women's rights and the whole set of human rights. I want to refer to the issue of accountability uh, uh, like my predecessors but maybe in, with a little example uh, of how much, especially accountability of individuals under criminal law, um, is also room for strategic collaboration to be developed. On, as you know, uh, ongoing is the trial since November last of Jean-Pierre Bemba uh, in the International Criminal Court. This case, uh, FIDH has been involved with since November 2002, so it's nearly a 10 years <laughs> a story. Uh, and <clears throat> uh, in this case, from the very beginning, uh, without the collaboration of women's rights, not yet NGOs, but key actors, and one human rights NGO in Central African Republic, the crimes that, uh, that were perpetrated and that he sued about, were perpetrated in CAR, not in DRC, where he is from. Um, well, this collaboration has been absolutely key to working with victims and uh, working with victims, in fact, not as victims. They were not claiming to be victims. They were claiming to be rights holders. And that makes, as we understood from the previous uh, interventions, things completely different. Um, the same is um, uh, ju just about, about Jean-Pierre Bemba. It was um, uh, we had documented 1,500 rapes perpetrated within three months between November 2002 and February 2003. The estimate is 10,000 to have been perpetrated out of 5 million inhabitants in CAR. Uh, and Jean-Pierre Bemba used to be the vice president of the Democratic Republic of Congo, elect uh, with 43% uh, votes in the presidential election with 70% participation, a warlord, uh, a very important, very, very important personality uh, who uh, is now confronting for the first time ever his judges with a huge victim's participation in the, the trial. Uh, now, th this about, about um, um, rapes, you remember, in Guinea, in Conakry, uh, three years ago in September, 
the, 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 the very huge, massive rapes that took place for three, for three days and summary executions. Um, uh, uh, just following on this point uh, uh, from, from the Bamba trial in ICC, now it's not in ICC that it's taking place. Uh, uh, victims as rights holders have been challenging their domestic judges. 76 of them have been uh, triggering domestic court, challenging willingness and capacity and actually got until now, for the past six months since they've, uh, 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 they've been parti civil, they've been involved as a party into the trial, uh, they managed to get five indictments of uh, high-ranking high ranking, uh, law enforcement official and former minister in this proceeding in very tough conditions, but this was not possible and is not possible again without very close interaction between the human, women's rights movement, human rights movement. Again, further developments to be uh, good reason for, for further developments and, and, and brainstorming on collaboration. I will conclude with a uh, last example, which relates to CSR <laughs> and to corporate responsibility. By the way, one development, expected development in the Bemba trial will be the uh, jurisprudential definition of what uh, is indirect co-author complicity, in other words. And this, interestingly, linkage between women's rights, gender crime issues, and, what, and human rights, uh, and CSR, and corporate responsibility, uh, um, will, is, is expected uh, uh, quite uh, impatiently, in particular by IT companies. They are interested to know what, com and not only IT companies, but we know IT companies, especially uh, uh, after Egypt and Tunisia, uh, I didn't tell you, but I have to, to, to tell that, uh, especially after, uh, after some IT, key IT companies, as you know, Vodafone and France Telecom or Orange were involved in Egypt and Tunisia for having obeyed orders to interrupt access to internet uh, during uh, appraisals. And they're interested about legal definition under international criminal law of complicity because of the dual use of technology, the dual use of our fantastic I, I things, and, 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 and the, the other side of the coin, which is repression, complicity, question mark. From the Bamba trial, we may have the beginning of an answer to that or another type of answer uh, that we were expecting since Nuremberg. But CSR uh, uh, is also another field for our strategic, potential strategic increased collaboration between women's rights and human rights. Um, I won't go back to the overall global compact, John Ruggie's framework, guidelines, OECD, contact points, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> I refer to our literature and, and all the lit literature on that. But I want just to give one example, Eric, because you wanted us to focus on examples for food for thought. Um, we, we are not only litigating and joining litigation effort against some companies, but also, when, when possible, engaging <laughs> with companies. Uh, and I want, I want to refer to, to, to the case of women migrant workers in strawberry fields in Spain from Morocco. And here, like in the, the previous examples, dilemmas. Women migrant workers are hired by uh, uh, Spanish producers of strawberries to eat, you know, these strawberries that we can find in supermarket as of February each year, you know, when, when the season is flourishing. And, 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 uh, and, and they make money and they make a living. And when they're back home in Morocco, they're empowered. And in their own community and society, they feel stronger. At the same time in the fields, one, they are hired mainly if they have one kid, because it's the certainty that they'll go back, school, etc. Second, they are hired for less than six months contract, saisonnier. Conclusion, no right to trade union and, and, and representation and collective bargaining, less than six months, etc., etc. This is one country which is 
as you know, part of the new Nobel Peace Prize community, the EU. <laughs> so it's it's a, it, no no no, no but I, I mean what, what I mean what I mean by that what, what I mean by that also is that it's it's supposed to be a country where there's where law is not missing. I mean there, there's law. There's a lot of law. There's, I mean, Habermas would be, um, I guess, is super happy in such a situation, right? There's law, there are standards, there are procedures, there, you know, from ILO, EU, da 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 da. To, I mean, there's everything. <laughs> there's rule of law. There, but they're exactly the same. No, I wouldn't say they're Somangali scheme, but I mean the same typology of problems, uh, uh, over time unpaid. No, 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 no possibility for collective bargaining and collective representation. I mean, this is some. I mean, violations we find. We, we, we have colleagues from Bangladesh, etc., who've been speaking about. So again, here, women's rights, human rights, organization, strategic collaboration needed, it, and certainly not only a clustered issue for trade unions or not only a clustered issue for human rights NGOs. Just one more example. Thank you. Sorry, it was a little long. No, okay. And Tom, thank you very much. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll get to, back to the, the Nobel Peace Prize later, I'm sure. But <laughs> I, 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 last but certainly not least, Johanna. Great. Thank you. Thank it's, you. It's great to be here. And thank you, Eric and Titi and your whole team for having us. It's been a few days of um, both fun and inspiration and very informative um, with old friends and new ones, and particularly inspiring to spend some time with your students and to see the efforts to bring sort of a, 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 the, global, the global perspective here at Stanford Law School. So I wanted to just offer, as some of our panelists before me have done, um, a bit of a frame of reference for my brief remarks. Um, first, as a good member of the academy, I took my assignment from Eric very seriously mm -hmm. to try to synthesize and distill from the remarks and themes that we've heard uh, across the course of these three days. So as I refer to them, I'm going to take the liberty of referring to our panelists by their first name, with the exception of the Honorable Judge Wald, who I'm going to call Judge Wald. Um, <laughs> The second piece of my frame of reference is that I speak to you um, in full transparency. I am not a lawyer. Um, I'm, I was trained as an anthropologist. Um, and Did we know that? <laughs> <laughs> How did you get here? No, the just, thank God. <laughs> the I have great the respect. Of the of the million. Great respect for lawyers. Um, the closest I have come, however, is as a mediator in the district court system. Um, but as an anthropologist, I've also had the opportunity to work for the past uh, four years um, at a research center at a university, like the Levin Center at Stanford, um, at the Hauser Center for Nonprofit Organizations, managing the justice and human rights work there. And I think what that's given me is a perspective um, from cro across disciplines. Uh, we work across Harvard with um, everybody from the law school to the business school, the divinity school to the School of Public Health and the Kennedy School. Um, so both as an anthropologist and in my work, I, I'm always sort of looking at those cross-disciplinary lenses. Um, and also sort of this perspective of what are the intersections between research and practice, the field and the academy. So um, listening across the course of these three days to the conversations here, there were three themes that sort of stood out to me in my mind. Um, and I will sort of uh, run through each of them. They are the theme of communication, competency, and collaboration, or the tango, as Antoine referred to. So we've heard um, this theme of communication from all of our panelists, starting on Thursday night when Judge Wald said, words do, of course, matter. Uh, we heard from Hossam in a morning session that revolutions are as much about narratives as they are about the facts on the ground, that revolutions are conversation starters and you can't skip the debate. Hearing about the work of Sisters in Islam from Zaina, she talked about the really important and groundbreaking work of opening a space for and creating a culture of public debate on Islam. And Rangita in a morning session also um, 
mentioned the very, I love this phrase, that language is not innocent. So across the course of all of our conversations, whether we be hearing about specific case studies or sort of the general ideas, there's been this theme of communication and discourse. And I think what we're hearing is that ultimately what we are seeking, it goes beyond legal rights, um, but it's about values and culture. And how can we talk about human rights and women's rights um, in a way that uh, people can feel closer to what their realities are on the ground? Um, and how do we communicate human rights and women's rights as a social justice issue, as part, um, as Hossam says, as part of the revolution's agenda, pursuing the public um, on this agenda as a social change project rather than a policy advocacy or lobbying project. So um, some of the things we heard were efforts to build linking frames to sort of shape the discourse and to um, uh, push and shift the debate. Um, we heard that from Janet when she talked about the need to link human rights mechanisms to economic and security issues. Um, we heard about uh, uh, Sasan called for um, the use of holistic frames like equal citizenship as a basis for discourse. And recently, um, Aung San Suu Kyi was also at Harvard, and she talked about the power of mobilizing um, the Burmese people through the frame of the question of what does it mean to live in an open society. Um, so we're hearing a lot about sort of this interplay from the local to the regional, the national, the regional, and the international level about how do we shape the discourse and the debate. And I wanted to sh take the liberty to share one example that really stood out for me from, from um, Hossam when he was speaking in Brazil in May. I was able to hear him talk about what he described as one of the most powerful roles um, as an NGO that the Egyptian Initiative for Personal Rights played um, in the, uh, the Arab Spring. And that was how, how um, their organization helped to create a new narrative. And in doing so, they were smart enough to avoid the polarizing um, debates about fundamentalists versus secularists, left versus right, ESCR versus political and civil. And they were able to help um, control and counter Mubarak's narrative and to generate support and expand debates on the public forum, which was, of course, on Twitter and on Facebook, um, that were way more advanced than anything taking place on TV and the media. Um, and they were also asking, like Aung San Suu Kyi, what, did it, what does it mean to live in an open democratic society? So again, this, this theme of communication. The, um, the last thing I wanted to mention about communication was that it's not just about discourse and debate, but it's also about the delivery system of communication. And Antoine alluded to this when he talked about um, the eye thingies and the role of um, information and communications technologies. Um, in my work in the past year, I've had a chance to talk to activists from all over the world. Um, one friend at De Justicia in Colombia um, posed the provocative question about whether ICTs um, are going to be the future, whether the future of the human rights and the women's movement will be based on the ability of us to figure out how to use ICTs, um, how to harness the power of the crowd through the power of the cloud. And um, another sort of layer of this issue is really about the governance of the internet and the access of sort of the internet um, by, by people in general. And that's sort of another huge area to think about. Under competencies, the second theme, we heard from Chris Stone about the work, our work being about the need to recreate power in every moment. He talked about how we are practitioners in power in a process of human rights creation, uh, moving from dignity to rights. And we heard from Judge Wald on the Thursday night dinner that as lawyers, and I would say as, as uh, actors wearing other hats, um, we're great at breaking log jams but we're not very good at controlling the direction that the logs roll. So I would pose to you, and I, and I know all of you know this, and if you were to sort of have a conversation with all of my colleagues here and the panelists, they're not only lawyers, but they are diplomats, they are leaders, they are managers, fundraisers, therapists, and uh, I think this basket of skills is something that we all have to cultivate 
in um, doing this work. And the key challenge that I'm seeing among NGOs and actors of all sorts is this need for interoperability of skills, um, the capacity to work with radically different uh, uh, constituencies and to communicate with those from UN agencies um, to multinational companies to grassroots activists and government officials. Um, our, the staffs and the volunteers and the constituencies and the boards of our organizations are, include um, urban planners, political economists, um, street theater specialists, uh, IT geeks. Um, we need to learn how to sort of manage work with and talk with all of them, coordinate with all of them. So there's a big question of what this says about the skill sets and competencies and disciplinary uh, perspectives that we need to do this work. And I think you've heard sort of how all those skills are called into play in, in this complex work. We need to blend the technical and the legal with the political and the cultural um, in, in a set of hard skills. Um, but we also need to cultivate qualities of our leadership and management that are adaptive, responsive, and elastic. Um, because as Judge Wald said, it's not a straight line movement. Um, you know, I was thinking about you, uh, Gaston at Cells, and the story you just told about how in this 34 uh, years at Cells, Cells has had to sort of respond to the build out of a broadened mandate. You gave the example of sort of um, taking on um, the work of sexual violence. But I also know now that as an NGO, you're taking on the work as a domestically based organization and leader of sort of your voice and impact on the regional and transnational arena. And how do you, as the leader of that organization, um, invest the competencies and skills of yourself and your organization to do that? So another layer of challenge. And then finally, um, under this theme of collaboration, um, you've stolen my th thunder, but I think it's really quite <laughs> telling that the EU was awarded the Nobel Prize while we've been here together today. It says something about sort of the recognition of these um, collaborative entities as something that we need to be paying attention to. Um, and we started off at the Thursday night dinner when Judge Wald again mentioned, talked about our complex interrelated society, our boiling cauldron of politics, and how do we successfully move all the pieces forward. Um, Sawson um, talked about how our obstacles are cultural, religious, political, and national. And as we all know, the problems are more complex than any one of us can tackle. So how do we build strategies, hybrid strategies, and linkages with each other um, between or NGOs, social movements, international NGOs, the corporations, et cetera? And in conversations that we've had over the past few days, it's become really clear that it's not just um, a simple problem of diagnosing the problem together and then dividing up the labor, it's not that simple. That it's a hugely, that there are huge, immense, and political dimensions to the challenge of collaboration. And not only that, um, there is a very well-organized, fierce opposition that's hugely resourced, ruthless, and organized. And they're going to launch attacks and try to dismantle your efforts. And they're going to stop at nothing to defend their privilege. So again, this call for. Um, Cooperate, cooperation and collaboration, and we've heard um, different forms of that from the work starting out at the ground of the eight scholars who came together to study the Quran and became Sisters in Islam, um, and how your group now is going out to other groups like the Afghan Women's Network and doing trainings, collaborative trainings, to help sort of expand the work and advocacy for women's rights um, in Muslim societies. We heard about the um, Chinese scholars and uh, activists from Xiaonan, um, each working with each other and with uh, allies from other countries in a series of influential NGO events that supported learning exchange and support for research. Um, and in a morning session with Antoine, he talked and described about how the women's rights uh, groups and the human rights actors in Tunisia had joined forces to sort of have an impact there but that they're still very weak and that there's a long way to go. So again, this importance, this highlight of both the opportunity and challenge of, of collaboration, um, the, comp the, the challenges there, the competition for survival, this, uh, the challenge for funds, the territorialism, the lack 
of mechanisms for joint exchange, um, for strategic planning. That's why uh, forums like this one are so important. Um, and the two, two last points here. I think there's a huge challenge for all of us to figure out ways to engage with the community-based movements, with the less formalized movements, the public uprisings, in a way that um, doesn't seek to capture and instrumentalize them. Um, lastly, I, I really liked Hossam's point on his panel where he talked about we need collaborative spaces to engage in an honest and constructive analysis and critique of our work together in this sort of inclusive tango of collaboration. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Johanna. I'm, I'm going to uh, not exercise the, uh, the privilege of the chair and ask five or six questions that I would ask, like to ask the panel. I, I, I will say that I've, I, I've presented at and, and moderated hundreds of panels. And uh, the moderator's job is, uh, is uh, uh, greater uh, with a lesser quality uh, panel. And my job today has been extraordinarily easy. So I'm going to sit back. And are there any uh, questions from uh, from any of you, please uh, go up to the microphone if, if, if you have questions, and uh, let's launch right in. Hi, I'm curious, uh, those of you who are executive directors of human rights organizations, how supportive do you feel from your own board of directors and your staff and such to really collaborate and integrate with, um, uh, with uh, gender? Um, well, well I'm, I'm, the, uh, I'm the CEO of the organization. My boss uh, is a feminist leader and uh, the president of FIDH. And um, in the staff, uh, we've had rather the other way around. And it looks quite uh, frequent, actually, in, in NGOs. Uh, I mean, huge majority of uh, women uh, applying for the job for jobs uh, much more than men who certainly are more interested with making money in law firms etc cetera, etc cetera. and so the, the, the yeah the, the, the support is is great but doesn't solve the problem in a way or neither I mean it's it remains a, it remains an never ended issue for improvement. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Yeah, I would say that uh, regarding the cells, I think at the beginning <laughs> in the 80s or uh, early 90s, uh, the incorporation of women to the board was something like, was kind of uh, the affirmative action for the organization. And some, uh, sometimes a demand for the, uh, for the foundations, and we have to do that. And, and, but today, uh, half of the board members are women, and, and actually, uh, after a broad discussion on to e how to incorporate more systematically the work of women, we uh, incorporate to the board uh, um, a woman uh, gender leaders uh, uh, to the board that does work with uh, sexual and reproductive rights. I should say that the, regarding the staff, uh, the more than the half of the staff are women, but uh, not necessarily all of them were very supportive or, uh, or not supportive, but they care about it. I mean, uh, I when I I, re, I I I I I can't say that I am a, like a, a gender equality activist. I mean, within my organization, and of course, I I got uh, good allies in order to move forward with this agenda. And now uh, they are, I mean, more comfortable. But I think the 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 lack of sensitivity on the issue. Is across the gender in the, I mean, in the human rights organization in Latin America. Yeah, no, I would just uh, I'd say certainly there's great support for it in the organization. We have a gender program. I do think there's one uh, element that's worth mentioning in this regard. I mean, we work we provide a lot of technical assistance on truth commissions, on criminal justice, on reparations programs, on institutional reform, and we have then. What you would call maybe cross-cutting gender program, children's program, marginalized groups, and there sometimes is a challenge 
to bring those two together because you have you have an expert on the truth commission and then you have an expert on gender who's supposed to cut across all of those different and there's a challenge in working together when you're working in 15 or 20 countries around the world and you're trying to integrate both uh, what we would call the true thematics like gender like children uh, marginalized groups and um, and uh, thematics uh, or um, expertise on a particular measure or mechanism. And I think that's where we find the challenge. Thank you. Lana, do you want to comment on this question? Yeah. <laughs> uh, other questions? Uh, please, please. Well, it's a, it's a, a good question. Um, I, would, uh, I would say, of course, at the end of the day, uh, organizations like mine um, don't make the appointments. So um, at the end of the day, it's uh, the Secretary General or whoever the appointing authority is. We certainly, uh, we certainly have advocated in the past for individuals. We work with a lot of um, we have very close relations with uh, and partnerships with a number of states that I think are very supportive of um, gender equality and women's rights. Our principal supporters are Scandinavian countries, Norway, Finland, Sweden, uh, the Netherlands, which are very active on this front. So I, I wouldn't say it's any lack of effort on their part or our part, um, but I. Uh, I would think your point is worth underlining, and I'll probably quote you the next time we have a discussion on this, because <laughs> maybe I'll get in writing from you. <laughs> um, because I think it does go to the concern that, that, that I have, and as I, as I said earlier, and that is that and we're seeing more and more uh, transitional measures being put into peace agreements. I, I'm, I, it's, 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 um, it's a, it's a mark of success in one sense that uh, negotiators want to have those measures put in. So Kofi Annan negotiates for 10 years. The problem, the concern I have, is that uh, there needs to be a very strong connection with civil society and a national dialogue if you're going to have an effective set of transitional justice measures. Now, in Tunisia, they launched a national uh, dialogue. I was privileged to speak at that. Other, uh, other leaders uh, spoke, and you heard from civil society. There's a deep engagement. When you, when you make a decision on, an, on a truth commission or a, uh, another transitional justice measure, and you simply do it in the negotiating room, you do not have the support or the input of the victims, women, other victims, uh, the, the principal civil society groups, they do not inform that process. So, what do we when we look at what's going on in Kenya, and we have we're staring in the face of a failed truth commission. The report is way overdue. They're seeking another extension, and it looks like it may move past the election. Disaster in a lot of ways. Um, at Nepal, another example where you have you have truth commission, you have transitional justice measures built into a negotiated a negotiated peace. Where are we on that? It collapses once again a few weeks ago. So, and one of the things that we really, we're going to, we're going to partner with, the, this is public information, the Kofi Annan Foundation to start to have a serious discussion about this because I am really concerned about on this front and then also how we deal 
how we utilize transitional justice measures in post-conflict. It's not simply importing things that work pretty well in Argentina and Chile and putting them in the context of Liberia, even if you draw up the perfect Truth Commission map and, and documents and so forth, you end up with a failure. So there's there, there are a number of things that are, I'm getting far away from your question, and I'm not trying to avoid it. I, I, I think you're, it's, it's a good point, and I, I take it on board. But I, I think it's also part of a bigger question that we really face, and it is the question, uh, or one of the big questions facing the movement right now. We have time for one or two more questions. So if you have a burning question, you better uh, bring it down. Mm -hmm. Does anyone want to take a crack at that? The Frenchman? <laughs> I, you know, I, 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 there's, there's no question that this is a heart-wrenching problem. Uh, and I'll just say that straight up. It's one that troubles me I, I, a lot. I don't know if this group uh, feels like it has a preponderant expertise given what it does day in and day out or perhaps uh, wrestle as much as we need to with the heart-wrenching question that you raised. Um, shall we leave it at that? Or if you want to comment, you're free to. Fair enough. Yeah. Um, one more question. Yes, please. Yeah, um, I mean, I just will uh, mention uh, if we still have to improve a lot of uh, in the cooperation between human rights movement and uh, gender uh, and women movement, I think it's still we have to do much better for the the sexual orientation uh, issue. Uh, we at SAS, we have been working a lot during the last uh years uh i mean in the i mean we start to work with with the 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 lgbt when we i mean we coincide working with police violence in the early 90s because as the travesties were the main target of of police like in many uh countries in latin america and and now we are working with our lgbt organ lgbt organizations in order to implement 
the the law of equal marriage and the the implementation of the consequence of Dutch law, like adoption of of parentals. Um, I really I will leave to 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 David. I mean, if the if there is any experience on truth, I mean, thematic truth commission. <laughs> Uh, that I will call uh, just to investigate because the, the Salvador Brazil is another case in which uh, the, there is um, a, a lot of murders for uh, uh, hate uh, uh, cases for LGBT in, in many cities in Brazil. The Inter-American Commission uh, has decided uh, to, to work uh, actively on, on, on the issue and, and actually react every uh, time that a, a, a murder occurred in the region, but I think uh, I think is uh, I would just will finish saying that uh, the the cooperation shouldn't be only with the women or gender. I mean, with the women movement, but also with the other movements around, uh, and that I think is the, the the main challenge in order to how to share or how to cooperate uh, interact uh, strategies, but. It doesn't mean that we have to do, every, I mean, all of us have to do all, all the same things, but uh, how to be in communication and in articulation with different movements in order to potentiate the human rights agenda that uh, in some way uh, will affect or improve the life of different uh, groups. I know, I think I would I'd say that the strategy you outlined is the right one, Gaston. Um, and there may be some strategies of to the Inter-American Commission or cases at the Inter-American Court. Um, and, and I think nationally you need to look for political openings where you can pressure the government through movements by civil society. Uh, there haven't been, there have been some 40 truth commissions, but they have all been in the context of a political transition uh, from an authoritarian regime uh, such as Argentina or Chile or in a post-conflict situation. So a situation of, of massive violence. Um, you do have one in Brazil that is looking back all the way to 1964 period now, which is a, a big achievement, and we're working very closely with that commission. But that's the violence of the regime uh, over a sustained period of time. Uh, I don't, that, uh, theoretically, of course, you could have a, a, thema a thematic commission on these kind of issues but you'd have to convince the government <laughs> to establish one. Uh, you, we have s some experience with local truth-telling processes that come out of local communities that, don't, that aren't necessarily anchored in the law, and you see those. Uh, there's one in, uh, uh, there's some, there's, there's another, there's the one in the city of Mexico, I can give you the details afterwards uh, about uh, violence there. There's one in Maine regarding Native Americans. There's one in my home. There was one in my home state of North Carolina between the shootout between the, the Communist Party and the Ku Klux Klan. If you can believe that, all all ten members of the of the Communist Party in North Carolina were shot, essentially in in the 70s. So there are local processes, uh, truth commissions that there's a good bit of experience, and I'm glad to talk to you a little bit about that. Or you can check our website. Uh, the uh, the panel this afternoon has. Uh, has raised dilemmas and challenges and uh, provoked. Uh, it's, it's also uh, raised openings of, uh, of hope and uh, perhaps collectively gave us an advanced lesson in tango. Uh, and I, I, I'm reminded of a wonderful Indian philosopher, Ashish Nandi, who once said, our inability to imagine alternatives is the surest guarantee of oppression. So I thank you all for a terrific presentation. <laughs> Very quickly, I wanted to thank everybody. We have panelists who need to catch planes, I know, and get off. Um, but I wanted to thank Eric for moderating this fabulous panel, and Johanna for actually taking an impression off of the frame for Not this the wonderful symposium that these two have put together, which has just as easily been advancing human rights through gender equality. And I think that that is someplace that we all need to head. We've heard from amazing, amazing activists um, who show, I think, through the examples of their work that women do not approach um, the question of equality as supplicants or as victims, but as strong voices who are amazing.
amazingly inspiring. So thank you all for being here with us. Thanks to all of our student organization and university partners. Um, and thank, thank you. you so much for sharing your wisdom with our students and our community. Mm -hmm. Your case study is perfect. Yeah. Well, I mean, I teach it ever there. Yeah, yeah. No, it was good. It was fun to do. Give you a card. I think I gave you one.